What's up everyone, Ben with the BTC Sessions here and this is your daily session. Hodl the Bitcoin. Before we jump into the news, just a couple quick things. Number one, do check out my website, btcsessions.ca. This is where you can reach out to me directly and book your own BTC session. We can chat Bitcoin, wallets, proper security, whatever you like. All you need to do is scroll down to the bottom and there's a contact form for you there. Secondly... Big shout out to the sponsors of the show, Ledin.io. This is where you can use your Bitcoin as collateral for a Canadian dollar or in select international markets, US dollar loan. So really simple. You just go to the website. They've got a slider where you can check out how much Bitcoin is required for a particular dollar amount. It takes about two minutes to fill out the application. And if you're approved, then your bank account is usually funded within 24 hours. Um, now, now, this is a good option for some people. Perhaps you want to get your hands on dollars, but you would not like to sell your Bitcoin to do so. This could be something to look at for you. And right now they do have a deal on where if you apply for a loan and you're successful, if you use the link that I've provided below, they'll credit your account with an additional $50 worth of Bitcoin. So uh, check that out. That helps out the show if you do. Without further ado, let's dive into the news. Now, this is something I've been interested in for some time now, and I've been kind of experimenting and learning as much as I can, uh, but mixed cryptocurrency transactions are up 300% as crypto users pursue anonymity. Now, uh, there is uh, something called CoinJoin for Bitcoin, and this is essentially when you're, you group your own transaction with a bunch of other transactions from other people, and uh, let's say I wanted to spend 0.1 Bitcoin, and I wanted to send it somewhere. Well, what you can do is you can mix all of these transactions for the same amount, and because of the same amount, it doesn't matter matter where it goes, whether it goes to your recipient or to your own wallet or to somebody else's wallet, as long as you get the point one. And so essentially it mixes the in inputs and outputs uh, so that it's more or less very, very difficult to figure out who sent what where. Um, so a lot of this is thanks to easier execution of this um, for regular users and wallets like Wasabi Wallet, which I've been playing around with. Um, they have coin join where you can essentially just kind of anonymize your coins. So really cool. I recommend checking them out. And also Samurai Wallet, which is a mobile wallet, is working on adding in something called uh, what is it called actually? Uh, Whirlpool, that's what it's called. So Whirlpool, same kind of idea where in mixing together a bunch of different sources of coins, every transaction can look like or actually be a coin join, which just affords you a lot of anonymity and breaks those linkages between yourself and the coins you are holding. So Definitely worth checking out both of these wallets. Um, I've been using Samurai on mobile for quite some time. I've been using uh, Wasabi on my desktop for a while now too. Um, I like both projects and uh, look forward to seeing them grow. Uh, but overall, yeah, cryptocurrency transactions, coin join transactions are up quite a bit. Now, they're still sitting at only 4% of all Bitcoin payments, but that's quite a bit when you consider how many people are using just wallets like Coinbase or which isn't really a wallet, it's actually a, a custodial service, but you know, the blockchain.info or, or uh, you know, a variety of other basic wallets that don't have this built in by default. The fact that 4% of all Bitcoin payments are already coin join is, is pretty incredible. It's it's nice to see it leaning that way because I do believe that people deserve financial privacy. And the thing with Bitcoin is because it's an open ledger, once you make that link between an individual and their coins, then you are now capable of tracing around that money and seeing what addresses it goes to. And that can be very, not only de-anonymizing, but um, a lot of personal data can be leaked that way. So uh, it's good to see solutions being brought forward for mainstream users. Now, is this super, super user-friendly yet? Well, 
Uh, no, because you have to have a kind of an in-depth knowledge of how Bitcoin transactions work in the back end in the first place. But I'm confident that over time, these tools will continue to get better and uh, be easier for regular users to just use and not have to understand what's going on. Anyways, I will move on from there. Now, I was talking about Tether the other day and Bitfinex and how there was a potential $850 million cover up and and a potential loan or something that was going on and how the uh, attorney general in New York was investigating and trying to out them. Well, it has come out in documents uh, released by uh, the Tether lawyer <laughs> that Tether currently is only backed 74%. So 74% of all tethers issued uh, have an actual dollar behind them. But the rest is, is I guess, an asset which would just be a loan to Bitfinex. So for those of you unfamiliar, Bitfinex is an online exchange. Tether is a coin that is supposed to or originally was supposed to be backed one to one by the US dollar. So if somebody puts one dollar into Tether, then there is a single Tether created. And and when they redeem that dollar, that tether is destroyed, supposedly. Well, what ended up happening here is Bitfinex, um, they had some money tied up in a bank, a banking solution specifically for crypto exchanges to the tune of $850 million. And those funds were quarantined and cordoned off and protected, and they don't have immediate access to them. Well, what do they do in order to kind of keep the exchange running and not feel that pinch. Well, since the same CEO runs Tether and Bitfinex, Tether gave a loan to Bitfinex to the tune of, oh, I'm not quite sure here. We'll just say hundreds of millions of dollars. So quite a bit. Um, I'm pretty sure it was around the range of around 600 million, but I have heard 700 million batted around as well. Anyways, it was a lot of money. So that has contributed to the fact that Tether is no longer backed one to one. Now, also, I talked about this a while back that Tether mysteriously changed their terms of service a little while ago. I It seems to be in connection with this, but it used to be every Tether is backed one to one with US dollars. Well, now, the terms of service read something along the lines of every tether is backed one to one via US dollars or equivalent assets. So it could be anything. And in this case, it looks like it was the loan to Bitfinex. So when a company or a bank gives out a loan, they consider that an asset. It is money that is owed to them and they consider it as as there, something that they owe or something that they own because somebody is in, uh, obligated to pay them back. Well, the problem with this is, and I see a few, but one of the problems here is this loan wouldn't have been a big deal as a comp from a company standpoint, assuming that Bitfinex continued to operate in profit, which it is quite a profitable company. The problem is, as soon as the attorney general shone a light on this, well, you started to see mass withdrawals from Bitfinex because people didn't trust the platform anymore. And that could impact profitability, which could impact the loan that is outstanding to Tether, which could impact the backing of Tether one-to-one -one if they don't recoup that loan. Now, do I think they're not going to recoup the loan? Probably not. I'm sure they'll be able to figure it out. Um, but this just kind of shows if there's that malleability, if there's that fluidity to, oh, we're backed one to one, oh, we're backed one to one kind of, but in US dollar equivalent loans. And so it, it just leads to this slippery slope where, sure, maybe it might work out this time where the loan works out fine, they make a, a little bit of a profit back from it, from the interest, and everything is great. But what happens when enough of those loans, when you start to give out the backing and lend out the backing and enough of those loans default? Well, then you get a coin that is not backed. Like right now, if everybody wanted to redeem their tether, well, there's only enough to pay everybody 74 cents on the dollar or 74% of people would get their one-to-one -one and then everyone else would be shit out of luck. So 
again, when you look at the number 74%, you think, oh, wow, 26% isn't there. But when you look at the traditional banking system, I mean, there's nowhere close to 74% in sitting in reserves when it comes to a bank. Way, way less. But, I mean, Tether is not that old. And already we're starting to see this. And so I think when you get when you get into instances of uh, what is supposed to be, I mean, cryptocurrency itself is supposed to be trustless. The idea behind Bitcoin is you have the asset because you have the asset. The asset itself is digital. If you can confirm it on the blockchain, then it's there. But when you get into a situation where the digital asset isn't the asset itself, but it's pegged to a real world asset, then you introduce counterparty risk. You're trusting that entity that what they say is backing their token is actually there. And right now, at this point of time, it is not there. It is 74% there and 26% of it is a loan that may or may not be paid back. So as we go down this road, this is... I think this will become commonplace in the in the future as these uh, stable coins continue to proliferate. More and more will, of this will happen, and I think if people don't push back, well, this will just be commonplace, or just you know, buy Bitcoin. <laughs> I don't know. Anyways, let's move on. Now, this is interesting. Uh, Bitcoin startup uh, unveils Thunderbird Lightning code for. Internet of Thing device, uh, IoT devices. So uh, there's a Japanese startup called Nayuda, um, and they're releasing an in-progress Lightning implementation with compelling new focus, which is IoT, inter- Internet of Things. So um, essentially, what they're trying to do is is kind of integrate payments into uh, smart devices. Now, we've seen this done by other blockchains, other cryptocurrencies, um, things like IOTA. Um, The problem with it is everybody's trying to create a brand new currency underlying this instead of trying to build on a sound money. So um, sure, you can get the same functionality uh, out of out of something that is based on another cryptocurrency, perhaps, um, but do you get the security, the hashing power behind it um, to not be compromised? That's a big question mark. So um, a lot of the narrative over the last number of years has been, hey, even if there are some great use cases or some interesting technology being built on other platforms, eventually Things will be built atop Bitcoin because Bitcoin is the most secure network with the most hash power and is the soundest money out there. And it has uh, that first mover advantage. And so I think this is kind of our hint of seeing some of that. Now, I don't think that this will make everything else dead in the water right away. But I do think that over time, we will see more and more stuff pop up on top of Bitcoin. Now that we're getting those second layers that can be built atop it. Um, you know, it's just a matter of time before stuff like this pops up more and more in uh, increasing over time. So now the name of this is actually called Tarmigan, which is the Japanese word for Thunderbird, which uh, is playing on the fact that it's promising technology built on top of lightning. So lightning, thunder, yeah, get it? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so uh, just a quick quote here for, from um, some of the co-founders here. So the Lightning Network has the following promising characteristics. Small transaction amounts are micropayments, borderless and cross-domain payments, real-time payments, large transactions per second potential. Especially the combination of A and B has the potential to create a whole new market. Because humans do not want to make payment actions many times, it is required to link with other actions performed by many people or with some kind of autonomous actions. Uh, Furthermore, IoT is one of the important Lightning Network application areas, but no one knows what the killer app is. 
In such a situation, an increasing number of developers and prototyping trials are very important. So they do have a demo video here where essentially what they do is they make a two Satoshi payment, which is like fractions of a penny to uh, create a transaction which triggers um, a a row of lights to be turned on. So the proof of concept here is that a tiny, tiny amount can trigger real world actions. So you can see them, they're uh, setting up the transaction here. You can see two Satoshis. And once it gets set off, um, that is some e-ink on the screen there. And once it gets uh, accepted, then you can see uh, it'll start blinking as soon as the transaction is successful. There you go, okay. So, um, it, does the world need blinking lights for two Satoshis? Uh, not necessarily, but again, it's a proof of concept. Can tiny, can tiny transactions trigger real world transactions and real world actions via the Bitcoin blockchain? And the answer there is yes. So what can be built with that? That remains to be seen. Um, but Interesting nonetheless. I, th I think it's cool to see stuff like that popping up. Uh, so guys, I'm going to finish up there. Uh if you are new to the channel, you can, or even if you've been around for a while, you can do a few things. Number one, check out my website, check out the sponsor, Ledin.io. Links for that down below. Uh, smash that subscribe, like, and bell notification icon. I'm always in the chat when this airs for the first time, so be sure to make it out and hit up the chat next time around. Um, and if you really, really liked what you saw, you can drop me a Bitcoin tip via the Lightning Network and my tippin.me page. I'll have links for that down below as well. And if you don't know how to do it, I've got a tutorial here for you. And just a little teaser before I go, coming up, uh, I just got my new CoinKite uh, cold card wallet. So i um, very excited for that. I've done interviews with Rodolfo Novak um, regarding this device before. So I'm happy to finally get my hands on one. And uh, yeah, you can expect a video for that maybe in the next week or so. So I guess we'll see. Anyways, thank you guys very much. And I will see you tomorrow for your daily session.